Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll just have a little bit of Q&A here and then yes. we'll take questions from the audience yes. afterwards. But just to talk a little bit about Russia, which I find clearly very interesting. Do you think that the Russians are sort of feeling the foundations of the old order shifting? And, and if that is the case, how has the Russians reacted to that? Well, absolutely, uh, because as I outlined, we have seen a shift in the global energy markets. We have new competing producers, large ones, and we, we also realize that um, you know, the Russian budget uh, and the Russian really economy is uh, primarily based on oil and gas exports. And, in, and here I, I would pinpoint even more, while oil has been a greater contributor to the Russian budget, so they make more money from oil rather than gas, but gas has been the source of that, you know, diplomacy, political influence, um, really uh, their calling card often in the world, in Europe, even in Asia. So seeing these changes, I think there, there has been a, well, there certainly has been a reassessment of Russian energy policy and in their new energy policy from a few years ago, they outlined that they will pursue the Asian markets um, and they will also aggressively move into the LNG markets. Mm -hmm. Uh, where, they, as I said, they've been lagging a bit. Uh, and at the same time, this effort to try to hold on to their key European markets, again, Germany, Turkey, as we see from these uh, pipeline projects. So, so, um, so what do the Russians have? Uh, I mean, are they trying to, to dump prices or are they trying to be competitive uh, on prices? Because clearly a country like Lithuania would, for political reasons, prefer maybe U.S. Uh, gas anyway for the foreseeable future mm -hmm. or uh, for a while? Mm. Well, um, you know, I would say yes and no, because at the end of the day, people are not willing to pay a price premium uh, just for, you know, political preferences. In that specific case uh, with Lithuania, and here I may add that um, I worked on the early stages of the Lithuanian LNG terminal. I was working as a political advisor in the Lithuanian government at the time. So before Lithuania had uh, plans for an LNG import terminal, it was paying uh, really some of the highest, if not the highest, gas prices in Europe from Gazprom, even though it was close by, right on the pipeline, but it had no alternative. So essentially Gazprom could dictate its terms and essentially Lithuania could either take it or, well, freeze, and we know how that goes. Um, uh, even before the LNG uh, terminal was completed, uh, Lithuania was managed to renegotiate its gas deal with Gazprom for the first time in its history getting a gas price discount. Before they would only go up the gas prices. But when there were plans for uh, alternatives, uh, when um, there was no longer a monopoly in the market, you know, the situation really changed. So from that perspective, uh, uh, diversification has had a real benefit uh, on the gas prices uh, for Lithuania. Mm. Now, subsequently, it's been importing Norwegian gas and, of course, this delivery from uh, the United States, which I think was, at least for now, symbolic more. Yeah, I think the name of the hub in Lithuania is independence, and that is probably yes. not a complete co uh, coincidence. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That's how they perceived it. It was... Uh, well, quite a, almost a historic occasion mm -hmm. when uh, the LNG terminal was launched and when the gas sh first shipments arrived. But can the Lithuanians, for instance, feel that it has brought about a change also in, uh, in, um, in political terms uh, from Russia? Well, uh, here, as first as a political scientist, I would say yes, uh, because uh, at the end of the day, you're no longer, every time you're renegoti renegotiating a gas contract, you no longer have that, if not a direct threat, but at least an implication that, you know, you have to behave, otherwise your gas prices will be raised, or maybe you won't even manage to negotiate a contract. Um, so some of the lobby groups, uh, some of the gas interests that were really at their peak uh, in, and here not just Lithuania, I mean really in the Central and Eastern European countries, uh, it, more in the north, uh, before their diversification efforts. So they were in their, in their peak in the 2000s, uh, uh, you know, early to mid 2000s. That has really changed and you can see that. But, but, but 
could we actually talk about the fact that the LNG and the diversification is about to bring an end to the sort of negative effects of energy dependency? There do, do you think this, the, the LNG harbors, the diversification, is going to bring an end to the sort of negative effect of energy dependency, for instance, for Eastern Europe? How is that? How would the effect be negative? Uh, well, I mean, clearly a country like Lithuania would think that the energy dependency of Russia is negative. Yes. I mean, now they have something to choose yes. from. Yes. Do you think that LNG is going to bring an end to, 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 to energy dependency as a whole? In theory, yes, you can say in theory, globalizing gas markets or a global gas market uh, uh, where you know, gas becomes a perfectly liquid commodity, it, that should do it. Um, now again here, uh, scholars really debate whether gas can ever be a truly, truly liquid commodity because its prices are a little bit different, uh, you know, the cost of uh, shipping, liquefaction and so on. And uh, even while these processes, I'd say, were in that process of this transition, I mean, it's not a you know overnight type of development, and there are still vested interest groups, uh, there are still monopoly positions that different, you know, not just uh, gas from, but you know, other energy companies have uh, in different world markets. So, so it's not pipelines like Nord Stream, yeah. Turk Stream is not completely yesterday's way of trading gas. Well, exactly, gas as we see plans for these pipelines right now, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, Agnia Griegas, how do you think um, this is going to affect prices that the US is being an, a net exporter and not a net importer? Mm -hmm. Clearly, that is uh, probably a topic of great interest mm -hmm. to many. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, given the influx of uh, new supplies into the market, um, you know, uh, there, have be, uh, there has been an impact on pricing, softening of prices. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also concerns, and here I have to say, while I, you know, maybe much of my presentation just sounded like the United States is, uh, you know, dead, uh, you know, hell-bent on exporting LNG, <laughs> I will say maybe not everyone in the U.S. shares that position. The majority at this point, yes, but not everyone. And uh, a few weeks ago, I was um, actually an expert witness in the Senate on the Senate's uh, Energy and uh, Natural Resources Committee, specifically on the question of whether the U.S. should export LNG. And there was some pushback, particularly from this, uh, from this type of angle. There was an argument, well, you know, if we start exporting our LNG, this could raise prices of gas domestically. Mm. Uh, this could hurt our industry. This could hurt potentially our competitive our, our manufacturing competitiveness with China. And again, here I'd say um, this view is somewhat of a minority view today, uh, although there are more debates like this, um, you know, maybe four years ago or five years ago. But it doesn't mean that these debates won't come back if, let's say, there is a significant you know, ga you know, increase in global energy prices due to you know, a variety of factors that could happen. Mm. And if that was the case, I think maybe you could see also a more protectionist type of mood uh, coming back to the U US in terms of their, their gas industry. Uh, we've seen a different type of protectionist mood. Uh, so, uh, so we probably ca certainly can't rule that out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, just, just a question in relation to, to the U.S., because you said something which I, I find very interesting. You said the U.S. position is still value-driven. It's just, it, it's not driven by commercial interests. Um, do you basically think that that is going to be the sort of, um, the, a lasting aim for the U.S. Uh, in the future as well, mm -hmm. uh, with Trump in the Oval Office? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that, uh, the United States position on um, essentially Euro U European unions or a European allies energy diversification has been consistent and values driven. <coughs> Today, I would say both their commercial and va you know, values and long term standing policies coincide. So today, I think it is a factor of both. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, President Trump came into office with a promise of reducing America's budget deficit, uh, boosting America's mm -hmm. industry, uh, economy, jobs, uh, and particularly the energy industry. So, you know, th this is also a commercial consideration and domestic political consideration for this administration. 
Although, if you look at uh, in practice, not much other than, I would say, maybe rhetoric has changed since the Obama administration. The Obama administration was also very supportive of America's energy industry and LNG exports, and all of that started under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. Maybe he just didn't have uh, you know, terms like energy dominance, and, uh, and maybe he didn't bring, bring up LNG exports uh, every time he met a foreign leader, which President Trump actually has done mm -hmm. in his, uh, as a president, his, all, all his, of his first initial meetings with world leaders. Uh, and especially the Asian leaders, that would be one of his main talking points, um, you know, that um, they should import American LNG. So seen from European perspectives, what, what are the American values? Well, uh, and here I would again emphasize as, uh, as traditional Europe's partner and ally, as NATO's largest power and really a security guarantor for Europe, uh, the United States is vested in Europe's security, including energy security. And you think that still is the case? I still think that is the case. Uh, because again, I would uh, say you have to maybe a little bit distinguish between you know, some of the rhetoric and the slogans mm -hmm. and the actions uh, of the administration. Okay, Agnia Grigas, let's see if uh, there is a few questions from the floor. There might be um, a few in relation to your presentation. Just raise your hand and... Uh, feel free to say your name and company. Yes, there's a microphone coming. Yes, hello, Lars Magnusson from uh, Amazon. Uh, short question regarding uh, the shale gas. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know for how many decades there still will be shale gas available in the States? I don't, but if you have the answer to that question, you can, you can let us know. Okay, I don't have it. <laughs> okay. And, you know, shale gas and uh, fracking is also not a completely new development in the United States. I mean, in fact, this has been going on for nearly 100 years. So when we discuss really, um, you know, the sh well, the preferred term is actually the shale boom, according to the experts, uh, experts in the States, not the shale revolution. It has really been an improvement of existing techniques, uh, you know, technological, again, more improvements rather than new discoveries. Um, but uh, gas production in the United States is uh, forecasted to grow, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future and particularly on the back of shale gas exploration. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to shale gas, uh, there are some development programs in the, the EU, I think, for instance, in, in Poland. Do you think that we will at some point see a shale gas revolution in the EU because the Europeans just will have to? Well, uh, I think that will de uh, depend on a number of factors. Um, for now, um, you know, again, there are only four countries have pursued uh, shale exploration successfully. And there are different, uh, you know, levels of consideration in the EU. I mean, generally, European countries are more dense. Uh, they're more concerned about environmental issues. Um, so, you know, those are kind of trade-off factors. But, you know, countries like Poland, they are also very concerned about security, uh, given their history, given their neighbor, um, and part of security is energy security. So I would assume that uh, some of these costs would be costs a country like Poland and others in Eastern Europe would be willing to bear. Uh, on be that because they consider energy such an important commodity. Yes, mm -hmm. and also such an important factor of their st really state security. Yeah? Um, but uh, we have to see, uh, again, like we've had this shale boom, we can have other breakthroughs uh, before we know it, uh, particularly in the renewable sector. So while uh, gas today is perceived as this transition fuel and the cleanest fossil fuel and, somewhat, and uh, a resource that help, will help us meet our energy needs for the, let's say, near term or a medium term, of course, there could be a renewable revolution around the corner before even, uh, you know, proper conditions are reached for shale gas development in Poland because actually there has been a little problematic. I mean, the, a lot of the technological you know, developments um, and uh, know-how is based on the U.S. market, on American geological conditions and so on. So past efforts at pursuing that in Poland you know, haven't really taken off. Uh, we will see what happens. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Any more questions from the floor? Yeah, over here. Lars Nydahl from Oil Gas Denmark. Uh, <clears throat> about 20 years ago, uh, with the growth of, uh, with, of LNG exports from Africa, the Middle East, and Australia, people started saying now gas is becoming a commodity mm -hmm. with globally free floating mm -hmm. prices. And of course, that never happened. Did I hear you say that now with the growth of US LNG exports, it's going to happen? I, I said that uh, we, well, let, let me place, uh, phrase it carefully. I, I'd say the, glo uh, the gas market today is more global than ever before. I think we have experienced a globalization of the gas markets, um, and that has really picked up in the last decade. And part of this has been shale, uh, well, America's shale uh, production, and that influx uh, <coughs> in the markets, but also that has been the, just the growth of LNG trade as a proportion of overall gas trade. And we've seen you know, this growth uh, year and year in uh, over the last uh, how, however many years. So we're closer there than ever before. But whether gas will be a perfectly liquid commodity, as I said, that's a question people hot hotly debate, especially in academic circles. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any more questions? Yeah. Hi, Ron Coyle from INEOS. Uh, I see much more investigative journalism coming out of the US tracking money flows from Russia through offshore entities to onshore law firms, to environmental groups, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm just wondering if, if you see the same thing, and if so, why do you think that is? Uh, I don't notice it being reported as much in, in European papers, it's certainly not to the specificity and the detail that I see out of US, uh, US mm. entities. Well, um, that's a good question. I wonder if it has been more the case recently in Denmark. Uh, you can, the audience can answer that question for me. Not, not so much, uh, not so much you're saying. Um, there could be several factors for this. Um, you know, one certainly is that uh, Russia is being perceived uh, by this administration um, as really a threat. Uh, it has been uh, Included in uh, America's, uh, you know, security and defense strategy, as you know, that in China as uh, you know, threats to America's uh, security. Um, another element could be simply the size of the media um, and their resources. Um, also, in terms of the think tank community, because of the lot of the. You know, also the investigative journalism and the type of articles you see uh, by the time they're published. Uh, you know, I, you know, I talk regularly to a lot of the, those journalists, and uh, they're also getting information uh, from, you know, the think tank world in Washington D.C., which is quite lively and quite healthy, and a lot of folks doing research on such topics, uh, and possibly. Um, because of uh, the sanctions regime, uh, really, since 2014. So um, even though the U.S. has pursued sanctions against Russia, I mean, there have been efforts to go up around it uh, by well, lots of folks uh, all over the world just trying to make money, you know, type of thing. And uh, this type of investigation journalism is an effort to bring light uh, more to and not let people, let's say, maybe get away with uh, circumventing sanctions. Thank you. Martin, go ahead. Martin Nisby, Oil Gas Denmark. Um, thank you some, for some very ex uh, exciting perspectives. Um, given that um, gas is increasingly becoming a political commodity, so to speak, given that Denmark is uh, self-sufficient with uh, gas supplies, i.e. a net exporter, mm -hmm. could you comment on that and the importance of that in a, in a global context? What, what, be, what would be the good advice to the Danish oil and gas industry in this context? Well, I'd say D Denmark has been very, very lucky, uh, not only having its own resources, uh, you know, uh, well, fossil fuel resources, but also having uh, uh, 
generally what is uh, accepted as a, you know a very transparent and uh, you know generally non-corrupt uh, type of uh, society and political system and economy and also Denmark uh, has done very well in terms of their renewables program so uh, from my perspective it's a real success success and I think more countries should uh, emulate uh, Denmark's example I think uh, Denmark however given that it's you know, it stands on pretty, you know, solid ground. Uh, it's not very vulnerable, let's say, in that regard. I think it should also uh, uh, be willing to stand its ground when it comes to projects like Nord Stream 2. I mean, I, this project is against um, your European energy security strategy, uh, as was outlined in 2014. The European Energy Security Strategy specifically states that the European Union should diversify its uh, suppliers, sources, and routes. Now, Nord Stream 2 goes against all three of these elements. In fact, it concentrates the suppliers, sources, and routes of Europe's gas imports. And Denmark play, it will play an important, important role in how this pipeline will pan out because it, it has to go through uh, Danish um, either territorial waters or the EEZ. Um, and uh, I think that, that would be my advice to uh, stand its ground this time because the, you're on solid footing. Thank you very much, Dr. Griekas. I think we are uh, coming to an end. No, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, John Johnson from Rambel. Just to follow up on Martin's uh, question from before, uh, because you said that Denmark is very lucky. Uh, there are parts uh, of, of people in Denmark who actually think that we should leave the oil and gas production where it is. Uh, let's stay in the ground and let's uh, make a living of uh, something else. Uh, maybe saying that we are lucky, you could turn it around and say, okay, what would be the immediate consequences if we actually followed that route and left it there? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, you can just look uh, a bit to your neighbors and look at Germany. Um, now, Germany has pursued quite some dramatic policies and I, w and I think with somewhat par paradoxical results. Uh, so they've uh, essentially, uh, you know, outlawed nuclear power. Um, they've now banned diesel uh, in city centers, the use of diesel. Mm -hmm. And uh, really the result, well, I mean, it's a great aim, right? But I'm not sure they've been quite ready for it. And I think that's pretty much the consensus. And they've had to now instead turn to more coal usage, which is, uh, you know, clearly worse for the environment um, and in terms of emissions. So it's, in fact, I think they, you know, not only they're not really meeting their hopes, but there may be, you know, it's kind of in, they're in a paradoxical situation. So, you know, again, um, at least for now, gas is considered, a, you know, a, the cleanest fossil fuel, a transition fuel. And until we're really kind of uh, in that full renewable revolution, it's still here to stay for now. Now, how long that will last? Um, we were also visiting the, um, when I was in Germany, the Shell's um, uh, technology center and, you know, discussing very exciting developments. And um, some of their researchers also say, we don't know how long this transition period will last. Uh, it can last uh, quite some time, or actually maybe we can maybe we'll have a dramatic new development that we don't expect and uh, maybe the window for LNG and gas will be quite short but for now the International Energy Agency has declared this as the golden age of gas so that's where we are right now. <laughs> well thank you very much Dr. Grikas it's uh, been a great pleasure having you here in uh, Copenhagen this morning thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks.